Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes, the finest quality money can buy, presents The Big Story. <laughs> One more cup of coffee, Bob, and I guess I'll call it a night. Tom Stedder and Tom Pay. And that's music, don't you? Oh, it's the lucky thing you stayed around. Oh, what's the matter, Harry? They need help pulling in the sidewalk? The price you came into the city room. Some gals been murdered on the L.A. City College campus. Your feet, kid. It's all yours. Hey, Bob, you The big story. The story you're about to hear actually happened. It happened in Los Angeles, California. It's authentic and is offered as a tribute to the men and women of the great American newspapers. From the front pages of the Los Angeles Examiner, the story of a reporter who set a trap for a killer with himself as the bait. Tonight, to Sid Hughes of the Los Angeles Examiner for his big story goes the Pell Mell $500 award. I'll tell you a story, remember it well. About the reward you get from Pell Mell, reward yourself with the quality high, the finest quality money can buy. Pell Mell. Traditionally, fine tobaccos travels the smoke further, filters the smoke, and makes it mild. Buy Pell Mell famous cigarettes, outstanding, and they are mild. <laughs> Los Angeles, California, the story as it actually happened, Sid Hughes' story as he lived it. Cafe to Los Angeles City College campus on North Vermont Avenue. You, Sid Hughes, top crime reporter for the Los Angeles Examiner, make it in five. But Captain Frank Jarrett and the homicide squad are already all over the place. Also, the coroner. It is not a pretty sight. The setting's quite romantic. Small garden, a bench, moonlight. But on the ground lies the crumpled body of what the short while before her must have been a beautiful girl. Her long, blonde hair is matted with blood. What happened, Frank? She walked into this garden and got dead. Oh, it's going to play hard to get in this one, huh? Everything's hard to get on this one, Sid. Yeah, looks like her skull was caved in with a crowbar. Probably a board. Found some wood fibers in her hair. What's her name? Where's she from? What's she doing? She didn't wear a sign. Well, even the police must know that much. Oh, we're waiting to read all about it in the papers. You will, under a ten-point head. Police baffled. Okay, Sid, I'll tell you what we know. And get off my back. Her name's Baba Yuri, a Russian dancer and ex-Follies girl. We figure about 27. She was enrolled in night drama classes at the college and a few bit parts in movies. The approximate time of just 10 p.m. as she walked home from class. The killer evidently came at her out of the dark. That's all. Anyone hear a scream? Anyone in the vicinity? I still say you're not talking much. You flatter me. I have much to talk about. Mind if I look around? Yeah. But go ahead. Just let me warn you. Don't get your fingerprints on anything, or you'll be in your own headline. You've known Frank Jarrett a long time, ever since you were a cub reporter and he was a desk sergeant. And you know he's a nice guy who's making like a tough cop because he's in trouble. A brutal crime that's going to shock the city and he doesn't have a lead. You watch flash bulbs pop while the homicide boys comb the area. You see their faces grow longer and longer. You see the body carried out and put in the wagon. 
You sit on the bench and light a cigarette, tossing the match over your shoulder. You know that's a mistake as soon as you do it. Your match could turn out to be a false lead for the cops. You swivel on the bench to pick it up, and then you see it. Hey, Frank. Go home. It's past your bedtime. I got something for you. What? Look. Uh-oh. Smith, Anderson, over here, make a cast of this footprint. On the small side, huh? Yeah, it looks like a woman. Could be Bobbers. That won't do much good. We'll know more when we have that cast. Remember, I saw it first. I get the beat. Here's a beat for you right now. I'm going down to the county jail to question a couple of suspects. Come on. You ride down to the county jail in the number one car with Jared to be in on the questioning of the two men in custody. One of the suspects... Stephen Margate is a 20-year-old college junior. He's in the felony tank. He feels sorry for the kid who starts raving hysterically as soon as you and Jared enter his cell. Please, please, Captain, I didn't do it, I swear. What were you doing in the area, Stephen? Huh? Just strolling around. Do you have any night classes? No, no, no I'm a regular student. I, I never saw it before, I swear. Where do you live? Huh? Grays Hall. Grays Hall's a long way from the Rose Garden. You know what I think, Stephen? <laughs> She can't think I did it. She can. I think you were following Miss Yuri. I think you followed her into the Rose Garden. Now, that's true, isn't it? No, no. I, I, I just go there because it's, it's so lovely in the moonlight. But you weren't there before Miss Yuri got there, Stephen. You'd be able to tell us what happened. We know you were in your dormitory until 9.15. So you must have been following her. Why? Did you have some grudge against her? That way you carried a club with you? It's not true. It's not true. All I, all I carried was a book. A book? Yes, she, she was so lovely. I watched her every evening from my window as she came and went from class. I, I followed her last night, I admit it, but all I wanted to do was, was recite poetry to her in the, in the rose garden, in the moonlight. What? Come live with me and be my love. And we were all the Frank, pleasure... Frank, this boy should be in a psychiatric ward for observation. You're yeah, right. Well, I'm transferred. You follow Jared down the corridor into another cell block that smells of disinfectant. This is the drug tank. The second suspect is Carl Barstow, a heavy drinking dormitory janitor who is found wandering close to the scene of a murder. He lies snoring heavily on the concrete floor, stripped of his tie, belt, and shoes for his own safety. Hey, wake up, man. I have some questions. Huh? Uh, there I go. There I go. Who do me sleep? What were you doing hanging around the Rose Garden, Barstow? I, I was looking for buried treasure. Better give me straight answers. You may be faced with a murder charge. The only thing I ever killed was a bottle. Did you hear anything? See anyone as you crossed the campus? Oh, sure, sure. Lots of things. Lions and tigers and a 40-foot penguin. Probably did at that. Sure, I did. But no booze. Never had enough booze. So I'm. So I'm let me sleep. All right, get your sleep. You need a clear head next time you see me. Some start, huh, Sid? A psycho and a drunk. You think either of them did it, Frank? Nope. Did you notice? They both had big feet. When you leave the jail, said you, you decide to check Bobby Yuri's background on your own. At the college registrar, you discover that she lived with a drama coach, a former Shakespearean actress named Viola Dunbar. She's out, you don't catch her home until evening. Who is it? Said Hughes. I don't want any. Open up, Miss Dunbar. I think you'll be interested in what I have to say. Well, come in. I'm a reporter. I want to ask a few questions about Baba Yuri. The police have already been here. I have nothing to say on the subject. Please leave. You play ball with me, Miss Dunbar, and you might get some publicity out of it. Oh? Oh. <laughs> well, what do you used to know about poor Baba, Mr. Hughes? Well, something about her background, personal habits, friends, you know. Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you very much. She was born in Russia, went to the ballet school in Moscow, I believe, and came over here on some kind of student exchange. She stayed. I wonder how she arranged that. I have no idea. I suppose she knew a lot of men. On the contrary, she seldom went out. 
Well, did she seem frightened? I mean, did you gather she was living in, in fear of something or someone? Oh, no. I think she was simply a quiet Russian type. Quiet Russian type, huh? Oh. Well, well, thanks a lot, Miss Dunbar. Don't forget your promise, Mrs. Hughes. Promise? Yes. But what music are you going to give me? I, I made quite a name as Roxanne and Cyrano a few years back, and then I was in a rep. Yes, well, you, you, you bet. Uh, what's for the next edition? But for what? Your story in the next edition isn't the big thing on your mind, Mrs. Hughes. An idea has been set staring by your interview with Viola Dunbar. An idea from left field, but it might fill in the gap. You head straight for Captain Carrot's office. I was over to see Viola Dunbar, Frank, after your men left. Yeah, she wasn't much help. I'm not so sure. Now, you know about Yuri being born in Russia. Yeah, it's all in the report. Well, here's what I'm thinking, Frank. Was Baba Yuri somehow involved in Russian politics? Did she say no to the wrong people and get herself killed? Well, I must admit that's a new approach. It helps explain the footprint. How do you mean? This calf here shows it to be a small shoe with a high heel, a woman's shoe. The indentation indicates she weighed 130 pounds top. But no woman would have had the strength to bash in Baba Yuri's skull like that. Take a look at the calf yourself. Well, I'm no bootmaker. That's the very word, said boot. Certain types of Russian boots have high heels. A Russian political assassin might wear such a boot. Sure. This is beginning to add up. Captain Jarrett speaking. Yes, Eddie. Where? Uh, when? Be right over it. Start subtracting, Sid. What? Another attack. Less than a mile from the first one. Reward yourself. About the reward you get from Paramel. Reward yourself with the quality high, the finest quality money can buy. Paramel, Paramel, smoke longer and finer and milder. Paramel. Reward yourself with the pleasure of smooth smoking. Fine tobacco is its own best filter, and Paramel's greater length of traditionally fine tobaccos travels the smoke further. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. But you get more than greater length. You get the finest quality money can buy. No finer tobacco has ever been grown. And it's blended to a flavor piece, distinctively pell-mell. It's your cigarette. Every puff, richly flavorful, fragrant, so pleasingly mild. Reward yourself. Smoke pell-mell, famous cigarette. Outstanding. And they are mild. <laughs> Returning you to your narrator and the big story of Sid Hughes as he lived it and wrote it. There you are, Sid Hughes, you and Captain Jarrett, standing in a small, dimly lit park in the Hollywood district. The two little and two late boys, while you were in Jarrett's office dreaming up theories, the killer struck again. The pattern is almost exactly the same as the first crime. Somebody leaps out of the dark and... For no apparent reason, back is in the skull of a tall, beautiful girl. But there's one big difference. This girl lives with a fractured skull. The medics load her into a city ambulance and care for the hospital. Find out anything about her yet, Frank? Holy mackerel, Sid. Every time I breathe, you want half my air. Well, don't chew on me. I didn't do it. I know, I know. You've got your editor on your neck. I've got the DA. So, who is she? Name's Flossie Drew, secretary for a health foods manufacturer. She used to be a diving champ, an all-American girl. Well, that goes my Russian angle. Never had much faith in it anyhow. There go my two suspects. Mm. The first time I ever saw a blank wall get blanker. You know one thing for sure, Sid. The killer's still at large and very busy. The sensational case takes over the front pages of every paper in Southern California. You, Sid Hughes, get your orders from your managing editor... Live with the case until it's cracked. Then get an exclusive on the killer. 
This means hounding Captain Jarrett 24 hours a day, practically sleeping on his desk at night. Still with him when he's finally able to talk to Flossie Drew in the hospital. He won't take long, Miss Drew. Oh, as long as we need, Captain, I, I want to save any car. Well, we're doing our best. So how did it happen? Well, I worked late that night. I, I ate supper in the office, and then I walked home. Do you always take the same route through the park? Oh, no. Very seldom at night. I usually stick to the lighted streets. Did you by any chance catch a glimpse of your attacker? Oh, just a fleeting impression. He was small, much smaller than me. Could it have been a woman? Oh, I doubt it. No woman could attack me like that. Well, thanks, Miss Drew. I'll be talking to you again. Any time you wish, Captain. I think you're on the wrong track, Frank. My guess is that it's a man. Then why the high heels footprints? That's the key to the puzzle. When you know that, you've got it licked. Several days go by. More suspects are brought in. All have alibis. And then it happens again. Rachel Glover, a student nurse who babysits in her spare time, is struck down from behind at 1 a.m. on Van Nuys Street in the same neighborhood as the Drew incident. Rachel is another tall beauty. She's lucky to get off with a severe concussion. And there you are again, Sid you, in the middle of the night at the scene of another business attack. The same exploding flash bulbs, the same homicide boys with their carpet sweepers, the same footprints and plaster of Paris cat. It's getting monotonous. Monotonous like the routine in a slaughterhouse. Only Garrett doesn't look bored. Here we go again, huh, Frank? Get behind the police line, Sid. Oh, wait. Behind the police line, I mean it. No more reporters coming things up. Well, what are you so star for? I heard you found a weapon this time, a hunk of two by four. I'm warning you, Sid, behind the line. Any fingerprints in the timber? Now, look. You've been squirming around in my pocket for ten days now, and I'm sick of it. You pop out of confidence with file drawers. I go to eat a sandwich, and you're between the bread. I'm sick of a lot of things, but mostly it's reported. Okay, all right. You're back to the wall, so I won't push. You're hungry, hungry for an arrest, a chief suspect, a big lead. You're desperate for something to chew on. I know it. Stop, but don't use me. Sergeant, take this man across the police line and don't let him cross it again. As soon as you cool off this news, you're sorry you had those hard words of Captain Jarry. He's a good police officer and an old friend, and you know the spot he's in. You're sitting in the Blue Diamond brooding over coffee and donuts when... Mind if I sit down? Go ahead, Harry. I've uh, been elected to make a pitch to you. Yeah. You know our annual press club gym day is next month. So? Well, we want to put on another musical review like we did last year. How about seeing a chorus girl again this year? Oh. <laughs> oh, no. I took enough ribbing last time. Oh, go on. You were so patient. You know, you're the only one who makes up into a real gorgeous chorus girl. Hey. Maybe there's something in it at that. Then you'll do it? No, but you've given me a great idea. Thanks, Harry. Thanks a million. Fifteen minutes later, you're walking into Captain Jarrett's office. Frank, I just got a brainstorm that'll smoke the man with the timber out of his woodshed. Well, you have to get in line. We get 1,500 suggestions a day and file them in alphabetical order. Hold still and listen. I want to masquerade as a girl and walk the streets. A live decoy for the killer. Oh, no, boy. Go away. I haven't got time for bad jokes. I tell you, it's a logical plan. We know he goes for tall, beautiful women. And, well, well, that's, that's just how I look in female makeup. <laughs> Ask anyone who saw me in the chorus at the last press club chin. <laughs> it gets funnier by the hour. <laughs> and every hour, your killer on the loose is closer to parting somebody else's skull. Now, look, Frank. You know the area in which he operates, all in the Hollywood district. You know the kind of gal he likes to hammer, long stem beauty. Set me up as a Pepsi for him. Let, let him make the move. Then you and your boys close in. Yeah, but what if he gets to you first? Not likely. This time it won't be a surprise attack. I'll be on my guard every second. Besides, I used to run 100 yards under 10 flats, won 30 out of 35 semi-pro fights before I became a reporter. Now, the answer still no. I don't want your blood on my hands. Losing your confidence, Frank? Don't you think you and the whole police force can protect me? All right, Eager Beaver, we'll try it. Starting tomorrow night. I'll send you a course on it. You should use a hard-bitten crime reporter. 
spend the next day like a movie star at preparing for a screen test. You do it for two reasons. To catch a killer and to help a friend, and maybe a third. There's always that exclusive story hovering in the back of your mind. You go to a friend in one of the big studios. He takes you over to the wardrobe department where they fix you up with a snappy feminine outfit. Then on to makeup where you're made up and fitted with a wig. Finally, at 9 p.m., you meet in Jared's office. See this map on the wall? Yeah. That's the area we know he works. The area we have under surveillance. You're not to go beyond it, you understand? <laughs> Don't worry. I have men placed at strategic points. Some are hiding in cars, some are staked out of home. I'll be following in my private car. It has a two-way radio in case we want to sector the area. And here's a gun for you, sir. No, no, thanks. Don't be a chump. No, I might get jumped and use it on the wrong person. Or wing some innocent passerby with a wild shot. Okay, suit yourself. Anything else? One thing. If I sense someone creeping up on me, I'm going to start whistling like crazy. We'll move on your first note. Let's go. And so you pace the street, stalking a killer, hoping that he'll stalk you. Up and down, past doorways, alleys, light streets and dark. Hollywood Divine, Blind Adventure, back and forth, back and forth. Good exercise, but hard on the nerves. You walk, mile after mile, hour after hour, night after night. Nothing happens. Nobody leaps from the shadows, just masses and jerks and two-bit operators make the usual pitch. Eight fruitless nights, did you, to pound the pavement in your grim masquerade. And then it's Sunday, a little before midnight, and you're out there again. You're bored and discouraged. You wander beyond the killer's known area. You stroll down Santa Monica in the vicinity of Hollywood Cemetery. As you cross a lawn near the main gate, you notice from the corner of your eye that somebody is following you. You quicken your pace. The footsteps behind you also quicken. You cross into the cemetery. And then too late to remember. None of Jarrett's men are staked out there. The killer can be lurking behind any of the tombstones or monuments ready to spring out at you. And nobody's around to help. You start whistling like crazy and turn to run and then it happens. Hey, hey, No, you don't. Oh, stop. Oh, oh. Okay, Sam. Oh. Let him up. We got him. Go, oh, man. You okay? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. But maybe for this $600 wig is ruined. What? He's a man. What goes on here? We'll be asking the questions. Come on, you. At headquarters, he gives his name as Vincent Slidell. He's just under five feet tall, but says he's a weightlifter, and this you believe. You fought with him, and he fought like a wildcat. He admits he jumped you, but denies any connection with the murder of Bobby Urey or the assaults on the other two girls. Sure, I jumped him. He tried to pick my pocket. In a cemetery? He was following me. I tried to give him a slip in there. You got it the wrong way around, Slidell. You were following me. Look, don't believe him, Captain. That's his racket. That's why he wears them screwy women's clothes. He jostles you and picks your pocket. You're wrong, Slidell. This man's a reporter. He's a decoy sent out by us to catch you. The decoy? You murdered that girl on the L.A. City College campus, didn't you? What? You're nuts. Those are mighty fancy boots you're wearing. But so what? They make me taller. They're going to do something else for you. They're going to walk you right into the gas chambers. What are you talking about? You see this cast of a footprint? It's a footprint we found beside the body of Baba Yor and the other two girls you attacked. Now watch. It fits the boots you have on perfectly. Why'd you do it, Slidell? Why? Why? Well, look at me. Can't you see why? I'm a shrimp. All my life, people laughed at me, especially girls. So I became a weightlifter. But it didn't do no good. Well, they won't laugh no more. Not them three tall beauties. They won't. I beat them. I, I made them suffer. Boy, they found out. Yeah, but not you. I guess you'll never find out. Find out what? That it isn't the height of a man that makes him lower than a snake's belly. <laughs> Yes, 
in just a moment, we'll read you a telegram from Sid Hughes with the final outcome of tonight's big story. Now we read you that telegram from Sid Hughes of the Los Angeles Examiner. Psychiatrist found Slidewell legally sane. He was tried and found guilty of the murder of Baba Yuri and the assaults and the other two girls. Sentenced to death. Executed in San Quentin Prison. My sincere thanks for tonight's Pell-Mell Award. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. The makers of Pell-Mell famous cigarettes are proud to present to you the Pell-Mell Award for notable service in the field of journalism. A check for $500 and a specially mounted bronze plaque engraved with your name and the name of your paper. Accept it as a lasting memento of your truly significant achievement. Listen again next week, same time, same station, when Pell-Mell famous cigarettes will present another big story. <laughs> 